I'm here today with uh, Julia Groferer. She's the, the author of uh, a book that's uh, hot of the presses right now. Felix just uh, received the, the package from uh, the, the press. Uh, the book is uh, laid waste uh, in uh, Romanian translation, uh, Una cu Pământul. <laughs> I'm very excited because I've been um, following your work since the early 2010s when I've read uh, Black is the Color, uh, serialized on uh, study group uh, comics. Oh, cool. And uh, I've been following you since then. So tell us about... Uh, f- few things about you in general your background sure let's see i come from new hampshire which is in the far northeast of the united states and then i went to college in seattle which is in the far northwest so really pretty far three thousand miles away and like I lived in the Pacific Northwest over there for quite a while. And then I just recently, well, not that recently, maybe like eight years ago, moved back east and now I live in New York. While I was living in Seattle, I I wanted to be an art major. I mean, I was an art major. I majored in art in college. I wanted to be a fine artist. So I have a a bachelor's degree, a BFA in painting and printmaking. The, The school that I went to, you have to double major. And so I was doing art shows and stuff and galleries and like... And then I ended up moving down to Portland, Oregon, which there's like a lot of comics stuff that was going on there. And I guess still is. There's a few different presses based there. Oh, and also when I was living in Seattle, I was, uh, you know, that was where Fantagraphics, my publisher in the U.S. is based. So I saw a lot of... There were Fantagraphics comics that were published in the free alt-weekly paper, uh, The Stranger. Um, and those that was really my first exposure to art comics, comics that were um, challenging, I guess, emotionally. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, they they ran uh, Tony Millionaire's Makis Weekly, which I love. It's a huge influence on me. I think if you have seen the way that Tony draws, you can see that I'm doing everything I can to imitate it, <laughs> uh, except for the funny animals. Al Columbia was also a huge influence on me. There were a few um, of his Pim and Francie comics that ran in The Stranger that were just so deeply upsetting. Um, (laughs) You know, like they're really, you you feel, I felt so unsettled by them. They're so bleak. Uh, And he, you know, if if your listeners aren't familiar with his work, there's a cartoonist who aesthetically is very cartoony influenced by early to mid-century animation like Fleischer stuff like that which is both cute and sort of threatening there's something sort of sinister about it at least to me even in the the those old cartoons and Al really leans into that so I was pretty horrified by those uh in the best way I loved it and uh Chris Ware also some of his I think they serialized Rusty Brown and chalky white uh, in The Stranger for a while. And again, just like there's something very, I think even poignant is too nice of a word. It's like really abject. So Rusty Brown is a kind of a nerdy, socially awkward misfit in the way that, you know, protagonists often are, except just really unlikable. <laughs> um, not in a charming way, just in, in a way that makes him very difficult to be around. I had saved one of the Rusty Brown strips that I really liked where it really knocked me out was one where he was, he had like a screaming fight with his mother because his mother had thrown away his vintage cereal box collection. Uh, (laughs) And then he goes down to his room. This is an adult. He's an adult at this point. He goes down to his room in the basement and he hugs his Kermit the Frog doll and he's weeping about how... There's this bygone era of uh, when consumer products uh, and media were so beautiful and now everything is so meaningless. And he he hugs the Kermit the Frog and he says, we lived in the very cradle of beauty. Why don't they see it? (laughs) And I just thought that was so painful to read because you really believe how much it means to him and also just that it doesn't shy away from how pitiful it is, how small this man's world is. Uh, and now we live in it, in the world he would uh, he would like live. Yeah, that's weird, right? People like Rusty Brown are just like dominating media now. So those were 
comics like that that I saw in The Stranger were that was where I first began to realize that you um, could make comics that were art. I guess I had read other graphic novels. I just I didn't realize that it was a whole thing, like a community. I read Mouse when I was very young, when I was in junior high. And again, like it messed me up. It's a very upsetting book in a way that I think it it wouldn't it couldn't be so affecting if it wasn't a comic. Something about the medium makes it get under your skin. So yeah, so then I moved down to Portland and I was again like trying to I was doing shows in galleries and things like that. Um, but everybody that I met was a cartoonist, basically. <laughs> and when they saw that I could draw, they were just kind of like, uh, oh, you should do comics. And there was very like, I guess, kind of like the experience of uh, being recruited to a cult. <laughs> you know, everybody that I met was like, come on, it'll be fun. Oh, I love your work so much. This is so cool. You should do this thing that I'm doing. You should do this thing I'm doing. And I was like, oh, I have all these friends now. But they they were not faking to recruit me to a cult they're my actual friends um <laughs> uh yeah so i one of the people that i made friends with was this guy dylan williams who published indie comics under the label spark plug comics um and i really looked up to him and he encouraged me to write something longer and more you know, again, I, before this, I wasn't really taking comics very seriously, and I would just kind of like draw them for fun. Like, if I was doodling, maybe I, I would draw a comic. Um, but I didn't consider it. I didn't think of it as my real work, where I was going to do my like serious art. But he encouraged me to try and make a comic that I, I took a little more seriously, and because I looked up to him, I did, and that was uh, called Flesh and Bone. It's a forty-page comic. Dylan published in 2010. It's about a, a witch named Jadwiga who lives uh, in the woods, as witches do, I suppose, and uh, helps this this young man who is uh, trying to commit suicide in a way that is not going to make him end up in hell because he uh, wants to be with his sweetheart who is dead. So I kind of figured at that point that you know, because like when you have a gallery show, which was really my experience up to that point, you work and work and work in private and um, then you ha you hang it and it takes like a long time to hang it also. And then there's like one night where everybody, you know, comes and they tell you how great you are and you get drunk and then, you know, maybe somebody writes something about it in a newspaper and then it's up for a month maybe you visit it every once in a while and then you take it down and nobody talks about it ever again so I kind of figured it would be like that but actually the book got a lot more attention than I was anticipating it got written about in the village voice which was mind-blowing to me which is the free alt weekly in New York so on the other side of the country and also you know to my mind at that time like a place where real things were happening whereas Portland is kind of pretend and Oh, it was in Best American Comics that year, and it was, uh, oh, it was nominated for an Ignatz Award, which at that time I didn't even know what an Ignatz Award was. So yeah, I got a lot of positive feedback for it, and kind of it kind of made me realize like, oh, I'm actually good at this. Like I, I'm, I'm getting, getting meaning across in this medium that I haven't been able to do in other mediums. So, so I kept on making comics. So that's the that's the story of my career, pretty much. Um, let's talk about uh, laid waste uh, for a bit. <laughs> okay. So um, do you want to describe it? Sure. Okay. So laid waste uh, takes place during the bubonic plague in the 14th century, somewhere kind of probably France-ish, but not super specified. And even you know, like the costuming and stuff is not too specific uh, with regards to a time and a place. And the main character is a woman named Agnes, who her husband and child have already been killed by the plague. And uh, in the beginning of the book, her sister is also dying. She seems to never be able to get sick. And there's kind of a early episode of her life that seems to maybe explain it. So she's kind of dealing with being um, stronger and less susceptible. And also just the fact that she's surviving all these people that she loves and is not really able to fully she doesn't have the luxury of giving into despair what else oh that she's her friendship with 
uh, her neighbor, whose name is Gilles, who is a man whose wife is dying of the plague, and he has several young daughters, like four or five, and she is kind of trying to support him and be a good friend to him, and at the same time, kind of envious of the extent to which he is able to indulge his his own despair about the situation. I think that's it. Is there anything I forgot? There are a few vignettes. Um... Yeah, there's a lot of like little cutaway moments of just like other people in the village, things that they're dealing with on a, I don't know, showing like the mundane side of the plague. Uh, street dogs playing tug of war with a human arm. Uh, some people who are trying to burn the bodies of their parents and uh, keep getting smoke in their eyes. A plague doctor who comes to check up on a patient and then collapses uh, while he's trying to examine the guy. Stuff like that. So it's very, it's, uh, there's not, I guess it's almost funny. I'm like laughing at as I'm describing it. It's that, it's that extremely bleak humor, I guess. But yeah, it's, I'm interested in those moments of, those kind of boring moments in life, I guess, uh, or where you, you know, I try to give people the opportunity to look at what has become commonplace to the people who have this experience and who are living in this, through this extreme event that they really have no choice but to, but to endure, which I think is a, a experience common to all people. There's a scene that I really like in the book where Agnes is baking bread. I really, I love to do like a long silent scene, <laughs> especially if there's like the same image over and over again with slight changes or like the same perspective. So you see her mixing flour and water and kneading and, and letting it rise and then punching it down. Um, just this kind of like methodical tactile sequence that at least to me is really sort of centering because I think, I hope, is it bad to say, I hope that most people have the experience of, you know, like, you know, in your hands what it feels like to knead bread. And I think most humans do. So it's like a moment that you can feel in your body. Like like a sex scene is the same, I think. You know, it's like one of those places where the bone is attached to the skin. That's like a, a physical place where we can all touch something together. So like um, a shared experience or? Yeah, yeah. Was it difficult to translate at all? I basically did a, um, a flattening for the translation. So I, uh, I did the first rough draft of the translation and then my, my partner who did the lettering uh, massaged it basically. Uh, if some of my choices uh, uh, she found uh, didn't really work or didn't fit in the bubbles and uh, so... Um, it's pretty simple, I think, the dialogue, right? Yeah, but it has um, it had a bit a few challenges in the fact that um, we don't really in Romanian we don't really have uh, words like um, th- these old timey uh, pronouns. Thou, the oh, we don't have really, those. really, yeah. And we chose to instead we have um, politeness pronouns, mm-hmm. and we chose to uh, have the speech a, a more uh, formal aspect to it yeah that makes sense to some extent it, it has a, uh, a, a similar effect because um, nowadays we don't really use uh, politeness pronouns uh, yeah and, so it sounds archaic yeah yeah exactly That's perfect and when you read the uh, older books everybody is talking uh, is using uh, these politeness pronouns between themselves even if they are friends mm-hmm. uh, or uh, close acquaintances yeah and, uh, yeah and so that's really very much like that yeah we, we didn't really use a lot of them because the, the thing is that they are also very long <laughs> oh <laughs> it, it was a bit tricky but uh, it, it was really difficult it uh, there were a, f- a few challenges but i think it w- it worked out uh, very well and i'm uh, i'm very pleased with the translation i think it's uh, cool usually usually when when you read the when you read the other comics it translated into romanian especially it sounds a bit artificial and i think this one doesn't I, again this Probably, I, I hope it's not, but it might as well be just my impression because I've sat with this uh, book uh, for a time and uh, I've grown accustomed to it. But uh, but I hope it's uh-huh. not. I hope I hope uh, <laughs> my impression is fair. <laughs> your your work is uh, is mostly historical fiction. So w- what I've read, I think, black is the color, played waste, vision, uh, the two zines. I've got two zines, so a lot of 
What are the zines? Do you remember the uh, names? Dark Age and uh, Too Dark to See. Too that, dark to see. That, that's okay, the yeah. only one that's... Uh... That's contemporary, yeah. I don't actively avoid writing contemporary comics. I had another comic on um, study group called uh, River of Tears, which is also modern and in- involves cell phones, in fact. But do you think it's it's a fair characterization that you you mostly do historical fiction or you don't uh, don't think it uh, it's really fair? I mean, I think it's accurate. I don't really do it like deliberately, but I guess I, I I'm very interested in history uh, and I think that the history that I read about inevitably regurgitating into stories. You know, it's all I think of my creative process a lot like a um like a meat grinder like when you make sausage you know and you just kind of like throw different chunks of stuff into the hopper and then like something comes out that's like a mixture of all the stuff that you threw in so you know if i'm reading about the plague then i'm gonna end up writing about well the bubonic plague not not this current plague i wrote laid waste way before there was there was a, a real plague not way before the bubonic plague way before covid is what i mean to say (laughs) But I have to admit that my interests historically do tend towards the macabre. Um, I'm just always really drawn to things that are upsetting. I haven't found a way to articulate that that doesn't sound ridiculous. But I, or just ghoulish, which I guess is really what it is. But, you know, things like... uh, historical disasters, mass death, torture, things like that. It's impossible to look away from, I think. And I I always find there are things that feel so relatable. I think oftentimes those moments of, you know, there are certain experiences that are common to the human condition, illness, love, sexuality, family, and fear of death. Uh, so when we look at our ancestors' relationships to those things, I think those are some of the opportunities to relate to them the, the most. And there's something very exciting about reading a story that was written, you know, a couple of thousand years ago and, and to recognize yourself there. But at the same time, I don't careful not to get too lost in the sauce, as it were, because, you know, our ancestors are not us. They thought differently they experienced the world differently there's a tendency you know for example this is a very easy example to go to but you know like uh witchcraft persecutions in the middle ages or the late middle ages or early modern period you know people love to look at that and they immediately want to relate to the victims there's like kind of a persistent narrative that people who were killed in witchcraft persecutions were like practicing some form of of matriarchal humanist paganism uh (laughs) that they were doing they, they were involved in some kind of subversive feminist practice when that is false and ridiculous um I know that trend of thought, and it's uh, really vulgarized uh, from from Federici. Like I I I know uh, I, yeah. I, I know I don't don't like Federici, but even she doesn't say that. In in Caliban in the Witch, uh, when she she talks about uh, witches persecution, uh, mm-hmm. she, she she already talks about uh, how the what could have been a matriarchal. Uh, condition was already crushed by uh, by Christianity and uh, it, those women that uh, were accused of being witches were like on the periphery of society and were already pretty wretched and it, it, it wasn't something, uh, not even she is glorifying uh, the persecution, like um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a really it's a vulgarization even of, uh, of Federici. Yeah I, I mean I think that there's something so seductive and uh so like there's a intellectual laziness that i think is really dangerous about like creating this uh myth of a more enlightened past you know like forgive me for going like directly to the live wire but like this is what the nazis did right one of the favorite ideas of nazism is that like everybody else is interlopers except for the aryan race which descends from this like noble ancestral paganism right like that's where all the runes and and that bullshit comes from which is all made up again you know they kind of picked and chose from the mythology that they found most pleasing to identify themselves with but when you start saying like oh well the ancient people did it this way 
then it, it suddenly sounds like it must be very wise to do. Or, you know, to have a more fun example, let's say like paleo diets, you know, like these diets that people follow where they're like, oh, well, I run for four hours as if I were chasing a buffalo and then I eat 20 pounds of raw buffalo meat because this is the optimized way to, this is the way our bodies were designed to eat. It's like, that's, first of all, you made that up. Second of all, like, I don't think that was good for anybody. <laughs> Even if people were doing that in the past, which you have no way of knowing, it doesn't mean that it was good for them. It doesn't mean that that's like the ideal way to be doing it. You know, it's like, it's funny to think about human beings like a thousand or 2000 years from now doing like the ancestral diet of like, okay, I'm going to sit in one place for eight hours because that's what the ancestors did. Now I'm going to simulate driving to work, <laughs> you know, like people are just adapting to their environment. There's no, um, I, I think the most, one of the most uh, dangerous uh, strands of thought in, uh, uh, surrounding this is this, um, uh, evolutionary psychology Yeah, that, uh, is basically more or less justifying cultural practices by creating these, uh, thought experiments about uh, uh, prehistoric people. Yes, they're so funny. I saw one that was like, uh, I wish I was making this up because it sounds absolutely bizarre, that women like gemstones because they remind them of babies' eyes that are like big and shiny. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know where to start. You know, like everything doesn't have to have a, a just so story attached to it. It's very silly. But then you, you um, again, if you can connect it to some made up reason, then it suddenly sounds very legitimate. And then, you know, if you can convince people like, oh, well, well, this is why women want precious gems. They want to be given diamond rings and so forth because they love babies. That reinforces this other more pernicious idea, which is that women are uniquely suited for childcare and that it's none of men's business to look after babies. And then like, you know, this just seems to follow naturally. And then you're just like, well, yeah, that's just that's just the way that the world is set up. You you say that uh, you are uh, you're inspired by um, that wave of uh, maybe early art comics. Like I I think af after you couldn't call them um, um, really underground comics, uh, it became like uh, formalized a bit and uh, more uh, distinguished. I think mm -hmm. they're more refined than the the underground people um yeah but they were very what what they have in common with the underground people i think uh, is this uh concern with uh, popular culture uh, yeah very much they are all um, making comics about uh, about other comics or about uh, people who are uh, uh, very into comics like where Klaus. yeah another cartoonist that i really like is um, um michael copperman who <laughs> is really more of a humor cartoonist but like very much about kind of processing the idiom of of slightly earlier mass media one of his most famous uh, famous strips is uh, uh that with the two cowboys fighting uh, about uh, comics being uh, through art oh or yeah art. whether comics are serious literature exactly so yeah. good yeah Uh, so what uh, what is, it's interesting about your work is that uh, it's very much not about that. <laughs> it's uh... yeah, I don't really have like a lot of dialogue with previous comics with like the junk culture era, era of comics because I don't I never read those, you know. Um, so the media that I'm responding to in my work is stuff that I like, you know. Um, mostly maybe books and fine art that I that are the things that I find exciting I guess um you know like you can see I had a book that came out over here in uh 2020 called Vision which is it's kind of like a Victorian era haunted house story that's like you know because those are the kind of stories that I like gothic horror stuff like that precisely about that I was thinking because even even uh, those uh, art comics people were very We're using uh, older comics as uh, and comics culture as material for their uh, for their works because uh, something I I really appreciate about your work is that even when um, it's historical fiction, it doesn't really read like it's uh, so it do maybe it doesn't read to me like it's in dialogue or it's uh, made up. Um, It's built up upon older examples of uh, of that fiction, of historical mm -hmm. fiction, or even of fiction from that time. It feels almost like realistic versions of those stories. 
like yeah. like v- vision for example v- vision as its structure and uh, its um, conflicts and uh, the movement of the story if it were to be described yeah it would be a a, a gothic novel a gothic uh, victorian novel but mm-hmm. uh, reading it it doesn't it doesn't feel like that at all it feels uh, much more uh, immediate and raw and uh, and uh, personal without necessarily being uh, feeling necessarily like a deconstruction like i don't know like an alan moore story or something mm-hmm. intentionally picking up the tropes and uh, pointing out how they're uh, wrong or absurd or uh, ahistorical or something it, it feels like uh capturing a, a moment in that place that happened to uh somehow uh, match the structure of, of a gothic story if you know what i mean mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I I should mention Alan Moore also because uh, I haven't read I've read a few of his books I've read a lot of them I guess I don't really like them they're not they're not for me they're not for me but I I absolutely love From Hell it's like my favorite graphic novel I don't know why that one is so much more tolerable to me and the rest are not but there can be something very his work is so didactic right like it's it feels like you you sat down to have a story told to you and then it um at some point became a lecture it's kind of i find that really annoying a few of his comics are literally lectures <laughs> yeah um maybe the thing that makes it work in from hell is that he put all of his lectures in the back matter so you don't have to read them in line in the middle of the story eddie campbell i think has uh, has a lot of uh... he has a good influence yeah like more is like maybe the the one comic writer who really has a style like if you mm-hmm. look out at a alan moore comic uh, no matter who draws it you can uh, really see you get that it's, it's an alan moore story because he has all these these techniques that he uses to make sure that the comic is visually interesting uh, a particular kind of sequencing of arranging uh, the information on the page of arranging information in the in the panel he for example uh, he has uh, figures in in various planes in a in a panel and uh, one of his favorite sequences is uh, while uh, some two characters are having some dialogue in the f- first plane something is happening uh, in in the background oh and maybe, yeah yeah and, and maybe b- by the end uh, it uh, interacts with the with the main action and mm-hmm. he he has a, lo- a lot of these uh, these techniques that uh, no matter who draws them uh, you get that uh, it, it's an a little more comic I, I don't think a lot of writers are really uh, putting in the effort Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has a, a voice, not just in his prose, but also in his, um, I don't know what you would call it exactly, like cinematography almost. <laughs> yeah. And I think Eddie Campbell kind of circum- circumvents that and is forcing him to to work a little differently. Maybe it's not that apparent because Campbell himself is using that uh, uh, nine panel grid, but he's using it a little differently. Uh, I, I, I think... Yeah, uh, you can see that that's like... A big influence on me that nine panel grid with the black and white and the um, the hatching and uh... mm-hmm. yeah it's funny how you can just lift something wholesale from another artist but it looks different because you did it <laughs> like I always felt that that was very I was like everybody is going to see that I'm copying Eddie Campbell and from hell here right and nobody has ever asked me about it it's never come up unless I brought it up first <laughs> the artists that I get compared to are almost always women which I mean not that there are not a lot of women artists that I admire, but I think that probably most of my strong influences are men, just because there are more famous male artists, unfortunately. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I get a lot of people have compared my work to Kate Beaton, and I'm like, <laughs> why? How? Like, I really don't see it. I mean, I, I think Kate's work is incredible, obviously, but I just, I don't, I think our work is like distant cousins at best. But I think they're just like, oh, they're the same generation. They're like the same demographic. I don't know. It's weird. They they work in black and white. They yeah. They, they touch on history. Yeah, I guess that. But that's like nobody has ever asked me or pointed out the similarity to Eddie Campbell or or Tony Millionaire. It's kind of weird. Kind of weird to me. A little bit. It really depends who who's uh, <laughs> who's saying this. I don't want to to presume on the motivations, but uh... oh yeah, well I mean like I'm talking about I guess people. If I see that somebody has maybe reviewed a book of mine online, like on a bloggers, podcasters, maybe like a Goodreads or, or Amazon review, something like that. 
if it's like a very general review or even uh, for a platform that it's not really concerned with with comics i f- yeah i guess you have to assume maybe like they just want to name like maybe the most famous person or somebody that their audience is more likely to recognize in some cases i think it's really the ones who they're familiar with themselves like i, I don't right. think even from hell i think it's more of a uh, cult classic than uh, something that uh, the general public is really aware of yeah i mean i think somebody like kate beaton is a really important touchstone because uh her work arises from like a kind of an indie comics place but it's so it it became so famous that it's like really cross-cultural you know people who don't read comics generally would still recognize her uh something else i i wanted to ask you uh still about uh this uh his- historical interest historical interest of you what is the kind of research you do or how much you do mm, i'm not like a very good researcher i'm not I have no academic background to speak of. I mean, I went to college, but I went to the kind of college where they don't really make you take anything except art classes. The books that I read are largely dictated by uh, what I find at the thrift store that looks interesting. A lot of my life is dictated by what I find at the thrift store. Most everything that I own is from the thrift store, which adds a, a certain level of chaos, random chance, lets me offload a certain amount of decision making, which is nice. And also I'm broke. There's that. There's, you know, I'm picking up things from films or documentaries. A lot of what I'm working with when I go into a story is already like ambient in my head. I don't write about a setting that I know nothing about. The Victorian era, for example, let's say I'm familiar with from a few different angles, um, from reading biographies of people from that time, from reading fiction that was written then, you know, seeing films that take place then which are not always super reliable but the point is not so much to be perfectly historically accurate as it is to be for my work at least to be comprehensible to the reader so if it is not strictly historical but feels historical to a modern reader then i may well include it anyway like a good example is um in laid waste which as i said takes place in the 14th century there's a a plague doctor character who you see him in the background, and then later he shows up. Um, he has one of those masks, those like bird-looking masks, right? Which is not a thing that existed in the 14th century. Those came around in the uh, bubonic plague in the 18th century. And they're like, I want to say Italian. Anyway, it's a completely different era, totally uh, ahistorical, an- anachronistic. But that's that image is so powerful. <laughs> like, you know right away, you recognize it, It means something on like a gut level, like there's something very sinister about that profile Uh, and also something kind of alien. And it also, when people read that book, I don't think that I ever say like, oh, it's the Black Plague. We're living through the bubonic plague. But everybody who has read it and talked to me about it knows that that's what plague it is. And they know that because that plague doctor mask is there. You know, the symbol is so powerful that it is useful beyond the question of historical accuracy. So I'm thinking a lot more about what is going to be meaningful to the person reading the comic than I do about, I'm not like super concerned with making a a simulacrum of of a certain time period that a person from that time period would recognize. That's kind of not the point to me. But, you know, it can be a lot of fun to kind of get, go off on the the, like wild adventure of, of, 18th century petticoats or whatever. I'm interested in costuming. I used to do a lot of sewing when I was a teenager. So I come at it from that angle too. A little bit of familiarity with with costuming, with cooking, with agriculture, different stuff like that. And so usually I have like a little bit, I have enough knowledge to get me started. And then I want to do research on certain details, things that I'm not totally clear on. For example, like a to, there's a, a scene in, in Vision where two of the main characters are riding in a hansom cab. And I had to like look up a lot of pictures of a hansom cab. Oh, and also I looked at a lot of uh, the New York Public Library system has like a whole database of historical imagery. And the, the, the comic takes place in like right around 1875, um, I think. I forget exactly when I said it. In New York City. 
Uh, so I was looking at a lot of street scenes from that period kind of to get an idea of how people are dressed when they go out, what are the shop windows like, what kinds of vehicles are on the road, things like that. I think at one point I had her take a trolley and the trolley is is based on a, a photo of the interior of a, of a trolley from New York from that time period. It's not necessary, but it is helpful because I can't just imagine a, a trolley. I can't like... I can imagine a dog or a dress. I can make that up from my head. I can't make up a trolley. I got to be looking at a picture. (laughs) I don't know what's supposed to go in there. So a lot of that, like looking for finer details is going to be online, um, looking at library archives or uh, for costuming. I I really like to look at, you know, the Society for Creative Anachronism? Mm, No. (laughs) It's just like uh, uh, people who basically like uh, similar to like Renaissance Fair you know, like they get together in their historical outfits and maybe like reenact a famous battle or something. But like very, very, these are like huge, like history geeks that are very detailed in their recreations that do like very meticulous recreations of certain historical costumes. They'll do like blog posts about it, about, you know, how they created the pattern, uh, where they sourced the material, how they figured out like what kind of material to use and the like assembly techniques. Um, for example, there's somebody that I follow on Twitter who has knitted like a whole bunch of recreations of like she recently knitted a I think a purse, like a, a needlework pur- purse with beading based on a fragment of a purse that was found in the the wreckage of the terror and Erebus, the Franklin expedition, because they're like Franklin expedition geeks. Um, so these are people who have like extensive knowledge of historical costuming and, and make recreations like for museums, things like that, or just to wear for fun. Uh, so I rely on their expertise rather than looking at the sources that they're looking at. But like I said, a lot of times it is, is more important to me that it feels right than that it be totally accurate. And a lot of times I'm just lazy. Like I don't, if I don't draw a thing within a certain window of, of inspiration and free time, then I, I might not draw it. So if it comes down to the choice between, I don't know, you read Black is the Color, like the, the boat, Warren's little boat in Black is the Color, like, I don't know what that is. That is like, it doesn't really look very much like any particular kind of a boat because when I drew that comic, I actually sounds crazy but i didn't have regular access to the internet i had to like go to a cafe this was in like 2011 2012 something so i couldn't just look at go online and look at a picture of a boat and i had a lot of books uh, that i will check for reference like a i had a book about uh sir francis drake's boat which the boat that warren is is on at the very beginning of the book is based on uh because some people in the 80s i think they recreated that boat so this is this is like contemporary photos of this historical boat that existed. So I drew that based on those, but I had no reference for this dinghy that Warren is in. So I just kind of made it up and it doesn't look like much. But if I would have waited to draw the comic until I had like the right reference image for this particular coruscant or whatever, I would never have, it just wouldn't have gotten done. So like, it's not perfect. It's it's kind of bad, actually. But something that's bad and finished is infinitely better than something that is perfect and not finished, you know? I, I don't know. It, it has uh, a sort of iconicity to it, which is uh, something that really, really works for uh, th- this eff- effect that I was talking about of uh, realistic versions of... Uh, of these kind of kinds of stories, uh, this uh, juxtaposing of uh, specific details and uh, objects or clothes or pieces of equipment that are more iconic, more cartoonish, more cloudy in their rendering and their conception, uh, and uh, even particular uh, anachronisms that uh, aren't really accurate to the setting but are uh, communicating to the reader uh, the precise information that. Uh, they need to to know at that point mm-hmm. when i um uh when when i read this comic uh i, I don't know in 2016 i think i read it i wasn't really even thinking about a lot uh, about uh, global warming and uh, and stuff uh, uh i i've become a lot, a lot more apocalyptic in my thinking uh, uh-huh. in, the, in in the last few years but uh, at that point i was uh, really just very depressed uh and um this uh, 
this comic and a few other stories like it, but uh, um, I, I think about uh, this one uh, quite a lot, precisely because uh, sometimes in a story you need to see this, uh, this whole world dying uh, just to, to find uh, expressed uh, what you feel inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, this is something I uh, I uh, really loved about it, and um, b- because there were uh, almost at, at the same time there were a lot of uh, this uh, comics about uh, depression and showing depression like a uh, blob of darkness uh, floating yeah. around the, the main character and uh, uh, oh my god that's um what is that comic that's like the types of indie comic Beanie Tuesdays indie comics different types of indie comics what is it hang on i'm looking it up beanie tuesday's guide to indie comics have you seen this it's so fucking good it's like it's really mean just absolutely eviscerates every type of comics every time i read it i'm like fuck anyway one of the types of comics that they mention is i'm so fucked up and one of the bullet points is always includes a scene where a shadowy version of the author says you're not good enough it's (laughs) like woof shit yeah (laughs) yeah that was totally a thing even in their very didactic uh, purpose, I don't think I don't find them successful. Like, yeah, it means nothing to me. People have different experiences of depression. I don't, yeah, of to course, invalidate whatever. But like to me, it it feels no. Yeah, it's facile. It's ridiculous. Um, it is not. It feels like a way of talking about emotional pain that is kind of designed for somebody who is outside of it. Maybe you know when you are. I wrote the book uh also black is the color which has a kind of a similar premise in that the the situation that the main character finds themselves in is uh very bleak and basically inescapable and very lonely and i i wasn't really thinking about like a metaphor i was just thinking like i wrote that because that's what the world felt like to me that's that's you know to a certain extent remains like my my perception of the world is that it is catastrophic all the time (laughs) uh and that you have to continue to get up in the morning in spite of that which sucks (laughs) but i think one of the not necessarily the purposes of art but one of the things art can do is inflict that emotional pain in a safe way Mm mm-hmm yeah definitely and i think successful art does that so can do that and uh it's hard. Like I, I don't think uh, a lot of people are uh, manage to do it, and even people who attempt to to do art like that or pretend uh, to do art like that uh, are successful in it. They can fail in various uh, in various ways. If uh, even if it's it's fiction, it can be. I don't really want to say that it's uh, like it can cause necessarily damage. But it can be insensitive and, I don't know, it, it, it can even create damage. But I, I think it, this is a very, this reaches into into a discourse that uh, I, I think went uh, uh, sideways. Uh, <laughs> the, all, all the talk about uh, problematic art and uh, art that is creating damage and uh, it's uh, people who are irresponsible. Mm-hmm. It's so it's difficult for me to engage with, uh, not that that stops me. <laughs> I have to admit, um, it's difficult for me to engage with that line of thinking because, like I think I said earlier, I I often am going to art looking for the controlled experience of being upset. You know, for me, there is something really compelling, enjoyable, cathartic in being disturbed, and I want that. You know, I have triggers. Lots of people do. I I will trigger myself on purpose because it's fun it's exciting i don't know (sighs) because it there's a kind of a creme brulee like crust of normal feeling that sometimes you want to pierce it and feel something wrong so the idea that art should not be permitted to cause harm is is antithetical to the idea of what art is for to me but it's also it's you know it's like uh if people are trying to um, prevent food from being too spicy. Some people think it feels good to eat spicy food. And some people are made very ill by it. And 
both those people have valid experiences and should be able to coexist as long as they're both able to curate their own experience. And I think part of the reason that this discussion keeps coming up in social media spaces is because websites like Twitter make money by showing us things we didn't ask for, which means that they're constantly inserting artwork and conversations from communities that we are not a part of, don't understand, never wanted to see. And then naturally, we're going to gripe about it, right? Like, who put this here? I didn't ask for this. You feel that it is being forced upon you. And then you ask, why it, Why is it here? Why is it allowed to exist at all? Yeah, and a lot of people uh, mistarget uh, right. the exactly. blame. And they put the blame on the, on the people creating that content instead of the platform that uh, basically exploits everyone by you. Uh... <laughs> right, because the platform feels very anonymous. It feels that like it is not making decisions. It feels, uh, you think that it's automatic. Like, I really like Tumblr. I'm still very active on Tumblr. Uh, not not posting my own art, um, but on my many secret obsessive blogs. <laughs> I'm like a big advocate for that format, I think. Although I understand that there's been some destructive discourses that come out of there, but I, I have never been directly involved with a, a disastrous discourse issue on Tumblr. So that's not my experience of it. Whereas I've been in a lot of fights on Twitter. That seems like a much more fightsy format to me. But Tumblr, you know, you just like see that it's set up in a way to be very, uh, the experience is a lot like going to a museum, like you encounter the artwork first, and then if you want to, you can look into where it came from. But it allows for, a, I mean, and this can be negative too, because the things are, are removed from their context, and sometimes that makes them more difficult to understand or appreciate or attribute. But I think there's something very exciting about having so many different gift sets of like Soviet educational cartoons alongside contemporary painting and like a photo that somebody took of when they spilled milk in their spaghetti and like Diane Arbus and just like the entire visual history of the world being juxtaposed, <laughs> I think is really interesting. It's really exciting, uh, especially, you know, obviously you're able to curate that to some extent. So it shows you only things that you actually signed up for, which is something that you can't say for every social media platform. S something that um, Tumblr did uh, really well, I think, is the fact that uh, it, it allowed people to communicate uh, using the medium that uh, they were more comfortable with. Y you have in Instagram a visual medium, but you cannot use words on it. Um, mm -hmm. And even even the the images on Instagram, you, they have to be in that uh, in that format. It's uh, you cannot really develop thoughts and ideas neither on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok. Uh, they're all very short formats and they are formats that are uh, uh, ascribing a medium to you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, especially if you... Yeah, if you're not a visual artist, then it makes it kind of difficult to participate in Instagram. Yeah, or even if you, if you like to to mix mediums if you think mm -hmm. uh, if you have some concepts uh, and ideas that you express better with uh, with particular images or uh, something that you you have to put in words it's getting hard something interesting that i, I was thinking about um, uh, a few years ago when i was making a uh, video essay about um, about web comics was how um, tumblr was this place where you could find uh, both uh, both you and kate beaten beaten in the same place <laughs> um, and you could you can find the uh, all these strips and it uh, it allowed for this uh, diversity of uh, of formats and uh, and approaches mm -hmm. and uh, the second thing it's uh, the fact that you could could build like your tumblr page was your own and you could customize it and uh, mm -hmm. build it in uh, in a way that it felt uh, more intimate i think and uh, it it uh, gave a particular uh, texture to what you were putting there mm -hmm. which, which again something like uh, facebook or twitter uh, everything is very impersonal and even your own page is very it, it feels like uh, it's a public domain which yeah mm -hmm. if, even on tumblr it, it's public domain technically because it's uh, it's but it's not uh, the, the fact that uh, you can cast customize your web your own page uh, sets some boundaries in a way mm -hmm. i think that helps i also think one of the things that makes Tumblr more successful for me is that it's actually very 
difficult to comment on other people's Tumblr posts, especially in particular, it's difficult to address an individual, which it makes it a little more difficult to get to know your mutuals, for one thing. And it's a little bit, I think it makes it less about individual interactions and more about group interactions. You can comment, but the comment is kind of appended to the like meta material of the post so that it's accessible to everybody who has ever reblogged it uh, or has had it reblogged onto their feed it is basically addressed by this. Yeah, you have to own up what you say. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you do. It becomes much more public. It's kind of like could only code tweet, but if... Um... I, I don't remember it having that uh, discrepancy between uh, accounts and uh, their following numbers, number of followers. and, and st- Well, you can't see people's follower accounts on Tumblr, which is interesting, too. I have no idea what any of my Tumblr friends, how many followers they have. I have no sense of it. And even like the ones that I know do have a lot more than me. You know, it depends on what It doesn't necessarily mean that they get more engagement, which is interesting, right? Like if I have, I don't know how many Twitter followers, I have like 8,000, then I get more, more people will like my tweets than when I had 80. Uh, And that doesn't seem to always be the case on Tumblr. Anyway, I don't remember why we were talking about Tumblr. (laughs) Uh, I think that uh, we, like you said, we tend to hold the individual creators accountable for problems that are created by the platforms that are exploiting the creators. And even going back to to what uh, we said earlier about uh, evolutionary psychology, accusing creators for simply observing phenomena that are cultural mm-hmm. uh, and uh, simply presenting stuff that happens. Mm-hmm. This is a very tricky discussion because some people indeed are making uh, really bad art. <laughs> Uh, uh-huh. y- y- using really triggering uh, events, but that's about them making bad decisions in their art, not necessarily the fact that those stuff cannot be approached artistically in any way. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, just the other day, there was a, a kind of a minor kerfuffle with uh, Ed Pisker's comic Red Room that they released a variant cover that was a... a kind of a parody of the cover of mouse which is pretty iconic and of course a lot of people were like oh this is in terrible taste (laughs) i was really offensive you know the cover of mouse which everybody who listens to this is going to know what mouse is probably right Uh, i think so yeah yeah okay it's it's like the most famous graphic novel of all time it's a holocaust memoir where the the jews are mice um and the nazis are cats uh and the cover is so iconic. It has these two mice kind of huddled and embracing in the shadow of this very large swastika. And in in the Red Room variant cover, it was like a, a Bitcoin symbol instead of a swastika or something. And it was kind of like, it was just like, uh, why? I didn't really get it, but I don't read Red Room either. So I was like, I feel like there's something I'm missing. But it, se- it seems gross, right? Like it, it yeah, yeah. <laughs> understand that like the concept of, of Red Room is something to do with like uh torture for entertainment and it seems like in that context it's uh kind of stupid to compare it to the holocaust because whatever kind of i said this on twitter also i think guys whatever kind of horror is happening in your comic the holocaust was worse so your thing is going to look like small potatoes in comparison so it's kind of a bad idea right just from an artistic standpoint it doesn't make sense but Fanographics released a statement. They decided not to run the cover, but they also said that uh, Red Room has done a bunch of variant covers based on different famous covers of graphic novels, which again, I'm kind of like, why? I don't, but put it in that context, it makes a lot more sense. Now I'm like, oh, now I understand why they wanted to do that. It's not necessarily about the com- about the content of that particular book. It's, it's, it's still kind of a stupid choice. But the point is, especially taken out of context, it, it was... It, offensive image and stupid just like it feels like something that should have been just for the that uh, kayfabe cartoonist kayfabe group uh, that uh, uh, joe and jim have and uh, it's basically a big chunk of their fan base (laughs) and a a collector item for that uh, very devoted fans Uh, yeah and i don't 
if it was probably like very amusing to those people and then like it got outside of the circle of people who like were in on the joke or who read the comic and then it becomes problematic right because the rest of us do not understand what's going on it's just like you're playing with this very fraught imagery for like basically no payoff but the point that i'm trying to make in all this is really that i I don't think the solution to that is to uh, say that that kind of work shouldn't exist or that those artists should be better at self-censorship or that there are certain things that we can't talk about. I think those are all very wrong-headed approaches. You know, certainly part of that process is that when you do make something stupid or offensive, people are going to be like, hey, this sucks. But that doesn't mean you should be prevented from making it or, you know, have your like artist license revoked or whatever. I think people should keep on making really stupid things. What I've noticed for for a while, ever since my, my Tumblr days, was that this, this kind of, uh, let, let's call it cancel culture, basically only works for people without power. Right. Like if you have uh, uh, if you have enough power, enough clout, enough money, whatever, you can basically go a lot uh in doing uh, pretty hard stuff without anyone challenging you mm -hmm. and keep and you keep getting work and you keep putting out work out there but if you don't then uh even well-intentioned things even unoffensive things can get uh, misinterpreted and uh and and then you you really get uh, a lot of doors close to you M maybe even the whole whole career close to you and uh, even people who championed you who liked your work even they get uh, can get uh, bruised off uh, in mm -hmm. the process yeah people will distance themselves if they think if they think that your work is radioactive because there's also like these fucking freaks on on twitter who will be like hey i noticed that you're following this person let me tell you that you actually shouldn't be So sometimes if you if you are friends with somebody who does something fucked up or something that somebody thinks is fucked up, like other people will harass you about it and be like, you have to stop being friends with this person. It's really weird. It's very perverse. This is a pretty open question. Like <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't really manage to, nobody really managed to, to solve it. But I think the, the targets uh, are mostly misaligned. Like uh, I think this is a problem of, uh, of platforms, of power, of... Uh, N not really of, of culture, because uh, people with money can hurt you a lot more than a piece of paper can do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. Of course, it's like uh, when you compare the violence of like, let's say you get mugged, you know, and you have your wallet, you lose your wallet, it's like a hundred bucks or something versus like wage theft, which is infinitely more common. And you could lose, you know, thousands of dollars. Who is going to jail? Who who are we angry at? Do we sit at home being angry at our bosses? Like, I don't know. I don't remember when I had a job, but I think it's much easier to get angry at the pickpocket, right? Like, because that person has a face. Like, you don't have to look at your boss in the face when he steals from you. So you like, you're looking for targets that are closer to your own targets you can see on the ground, you know? Because you can't really reach those people, the people that are really fucking with you. There's a joke I, I really like about uh, some, somebody who keeps uh, searching for uh, for his keys uh, under a streetlight and uh, somebody asks him, uh, why are you doing this? Uh, obviously, there are no keys here. Yeah, I know. I lost the keys uh, back there where it's, where it's shadow, but here is the light. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, good. The, this is where I can see. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's like exactly it. You go looking for your enemies where you can see them, even if they're obviously not there. A final question that uh, couldn't really be avoided is uh, the relation between uh, uh, laid waste and uh, the current context. Uh, climate change is becoming even more noticeable. And of course, the pandemic. I won't be coy and uh, say that, oh, no, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't choose to translate this comic because uh, it is completely coincidental that uh, I, I chose this particular comic to translate because, of course... <laughs> I thought it, it, it could be interesting in this moment to bring it to, to readers. Uh, but um, I think it, it also uh, it could get a new life in a way or a new, a new way of, of reading it. Because like I said, when I, when I first read it, it was very... It, I, I resonated with it because I, I was seeing uh, in the front of my eyes an experience that I could only feel inside me. And uh, it, it was uh, very wretched because I couldn't express it in any way and look at it in any way and it uh, seeing something that uh, looked uh, the way i felt was very powerful but now it's also uh, in a way about something that is happening to everybody mm -hmm. yeah uh, first of all thank you that's that's really beautiful that's i think the most important thing that we can do 
as artists is articulate things that people have felt and had to be alone with, you know? So it's strange to have, uh, you know, the plague within the story is a public event, but the relationship that Agnes is having with it uh, because she herself can't get sick is very individual. Her experience of it is shaped by the fact that she is not fully participating in she's not having the same plague that everybody else is having so you know a lot of the book to me was about loneliness and about feeling a kind of despair that you don't like she doesn't fully understand whether she really is unable to get sick or why it's happening so to me it is uh it is really different from (laughs) the experience that like we're all of us having together with a pandemic where, you know, maybe our experience is more similar to like Gilles' experience, her friend, that because he's just kind of a normal, normal guy. And I wonder, because the the stage of plague that they are at in Laid Waste is much more advanced than what we are at in the sense that their world has been much more devastated even than ours is. But in Laid Waste, the bodies are piling up. Right. Communal... I mean, they're like right there. Um, but I think that the experience of having to carry on in spite of that, that's been one of the most maybe disturbing things about, uh, living through a plague I have found is the extent to which we all have to continue doing things the way that we did them before. And it just takes so much extra effort to live your life in a normal way because nothing is normal. It's like really emotionally exhausting and frightening and it's just like a weird drain on your whole energy of of being to to bring yourself back up to what used to be your baseline, you know? And I think that that is really present in the comic in, you know, a much more dramatized way. But the experience that the devastation that they're living among is so shocking, but uh, they kind of have to act as if it's not because they just don't have time to gawk at it. You know, and there are moments where they stop and say to each other, like, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. To me, one of the most poignant moments in the comic is uh, when Gilles sees Agnes crying and he says, you're right, it's never going to get better. <laughs> there is something so important and validating in that honesty, I guess, that, that shared acknowledgement that this is really not okay. I think we we really need that to keep from losing our minds. <laughs> Which is something that uh, we never really had. Like we we never really uh, confronted the idea that, uh, especially here in uh, here in Eastern Europe, like we had this uh, in in Romania and Bulgaria, Bulgaria, uh, we had these uh, governments that basically kept announcing that the pandemic is over. <laughs> because because we had the, they had elections mm-hmm. and there were uh, there were uh, various elections it, there were uh, electoral years so there were local elections uh, presidency parliamentary and so on and they kept announcing that the, the pandemic is over okay go go have fun go on the beaches uh, and then uh, big surprise uh, the deaths uh, kept uh, yeah uh, jumping <laughs> somehow up again. pretending it's over doesn't make it be over. <laughs> Yeah, precisely th- this sentiment captured in the in the book is uh, uh, is very powerful and uh, quite unique because there are there are there are a lot of uh, media about plagues and pandemics and stuff even before the COVID one, but they are all are about either uh, preventing it uh, altogether. Uh, mm-hmm. By the end, uh, the brilliant scientists are cooking up a cure and uh, they are uh, spreading it uh, quickly around and everything is fine. Or they are about a society that is uh, utterly decimated by uh, by the plague. And uh, it's basically rather the story of, uh, of a new society emerging uh, from the wreckages of the old ones. Like uh, mm-hmm. th- there's even this, this show now... Um, Station Eleven. Mm-hmm. It has uh, two broad timelines: one straight at the emergence of uh, of a plague, uh, and then uh, in the present, uh, twenty years after. Mm-hmm. And um, what they're concerned with uh, in the second timeline, the timeline of the their present, basically our future, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, is this uh, emergence of a new society, of a society that has to deal with the past and uh, let go of it and uh, be be ready to create uh, a new society. Mm-hmm. But there is uh, so little 
about this very absurd moment where the world is uh, crumbling <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, or, or at least it's slowing down in a very scary way uh, but we still have to keep going taking care of each other but also going to work and shopping and doing like stuff that doesn't really matter that much <laughs> it's it's mm -hmm. so uh... well there's such a lack of direction that's like nobody really knows how we're supposed to be acting and i feel like that's part of what i was addressing in my comic too because when you're in like a really extreme situation like have you ever been in like i don't know let's say you like witness an accident or um you get attacked in the street say if that's ever happened to you there's like a long moment longer than you would like probably where you're asking yourself is this is this really happening like is this as serious as it seems like it might be and if i react as if this is a really big deal am i overreacting maybe there's a joke there's a misunderstanding i don't want to be the person who freaks out when there's nothing to freak out about you know you second guess yourself because your instinct is you really want things to be normal you want to believe like this guy is not about to punch me in the face <laughs> for no reason and you will continue to believe that up until he does punch you oftentimes because the fact that things have suddenly gone so wrong is is very difficult to wrap your mind around so i think a lot of the experience of living through a not so much an immediate a sudden disaster like an earthquake but like a long-term disaster like this is just not there's so much uncertainty uh you really don't know what you're supposed to be doing with yourself <laughs> so you just kind of default to what is familiar you know, you wonder why people, I don't know, you hear stories about people acting super normal when like ships are sinking or whatever. They like continue eating dinner. They're like, this seems like it'll resolve itself. Uh, because that's the thing that makes the most sense to do, even if it is ridiculous. It's really like an awkward position to be in. <laughs> and then in, in after the fact, when it's over, then you can look back and say, oh, we were right to panic. Here's what we should have done. But right now there's no direction. There's no certainty. We don't know. And that feels terrible <laughs> if there's some direction if somebody can name it then that's so much easier to deal with which i think is why it is so powerful to have uh Gilles straightforwardly say that things are bad because it's just such a relief to give it a name you know no i think in in, in our case there is some there is some direction like uh, th th this is basically where the the differences uh, arise because in a way in in their situation what they are doing it makes sense like yeah you are uh, making bread you are going on with uh, your basic uh, reproduction yeah basically. they're milking the cows and stuff M milking the cows yeah because really there is nothing else to do in our case there are some things that we we are still doing that are really absurd and mm -hmm. uh, there are things that we could be doing and uh, aren't not necessarily we because th this is the the frustrating part we as individuals don't really have that much power but the people we have invested with uh, with power through uh, our various uh, political uh, institutions they are the ones that uh, aren't really doing the things that uh, we know could be done mm -hmm. Like not not even uh, something as uh, a, as a strong uh, authoritarian response like they've done in China, but uh, better delivery of of vaccines, uh, support for people who don't uh, who who really cannot go on with uh, with these kinds of activities. There are things that could be done. And, uh... mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a, a lot of the emotional pain that people feel now about the pandemic is, is not just the life the loss of the the lifestyle that we had before but i think people feel really uh abandoned by their leaders in a way that a lot of people have not had to really look at head on before just like the total failure of institutions that we had put our trust in which is you know that's really devastating kind of like uh to realize that nobody is is flying the plane <laughs> or that they decided they have better things to do that they would make more money if the plane goes down yeah th this is more it uh, I think I've covered uh, most of the things I wanted to to talk about. Yeah, on uh, that note, well, I'm sorry. I, one thing that I can never do in an interview is is bring a a ray of sunshine. It's just not my work does not facilitate it. So I I apologize. <laughs> it's 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 okay. As uh, as I've said, 
at, at the beginning we are living in a rusty brown's world there is yeah. more more than enough sunshine out there uh we are scorched in sunshine sometimes uh some some shadow is uh is perfectly fine is uh not even perfectly fine it's much needed good yeah i agree it's a very good way to put it Uh, if you if you have any last remarks and or if you want to talk about anything that uh, I feel I didn't cover and you feel it's important to bring up, mm, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my username on everything is Thorazos T H O R A Z as in zebra O S like Thorazine the drug, uh, but Thorazos um. So like on on Twitter and on uh, Etsy, Threadless, Patreon, all that shit. I got all that. You can go there, buy my books, give give me money if you want. <laughs> okay. It's been a okay. pleasure talking with you. Thank you. The same. Bye. <laughs>